Um, hello to all, everybody who's listening and especially to Hannah and Karen, whom I know, uh, fellow practi practitioners of, of feminist foreign policy. I'm going to try to be brief. I'm not going to delve into the specifics of the report because this, this is the second part of, of this uh, webinar. I will try to sort of answer the uh, seminal question, which is why is feminist foreign policy important today? Um, by making three cases, three arguments, which I think are embedded into the report, but I also want to complement them. So my first case is um, in a time of crisis that we're all going through in the time of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, I have seen, and I think we have all seen as practitioners, how feminist foreign policy is even more important than I actually thought it was even before the pandemic. And take it for granted that as a, as a long time feminist and ambassador for women's rights, I always thought it was important, but I actually realized with even more acuity this year, how far we are from our goal. And this is to say that um, at the time when the pandemic hit most of the world uh, at the beginning of this year in the spring of 2020, and at the time where most countries went into lockdown and the time where most states and governments decided to come up with emergency measures um, to compensate for the pandemic, to protect their own populations, to help other countries, we all realized, and this is based on conversations with my counterparts from Sweden, from Canada, from Mexico, from Spain, and from many, but are definitely very invested in uh, gender equality, how little our voices count. So when, you know, uh, the decision-making circles gathered in the presidential palaces or in the prime minister's office to design a response to the COVID crisis, First, most in most circles, even in the most developed countries, even in Sweden, there were almost no women at the table. Second, the gender equality angle was an entirely absent from the first draft of the response to the crisis. And I'm talking both about the national response and the international response. And this was quite obvious. And again, this, this is based on a dialogues I had with my counterparts that it was just not integrated. This was not just as mainstream as we thought it would be, even in countries like Sweden and Canada, that they would think to integrate the gender angle into uh, the, the response. And we had to fight internally very hard so that in the second draft of the response, in the third draft, in the fourth draft, and even now as, you know, most of the member states are designing uh, sort of a emergency stimulus packages also at the level of the European Union. It's very hard to make the case that you have to have at least um, uh, gender disaggregated data on what is the impact of your stimulus package on women specifically. And do you have specific measures for gender equality and so on and so on. So this, this kind of links to, um, I think, one aspect that is underlying in the report that also might be more enhanced is that to adopt a feminist foreign policy and to implement it is an institutional revolution and whether you like it or not you have to still think when you're a diplomat when you're making foreign policy in terms of institutions what are the institutions that are making policy as a government representative I work for the government, I work for the Minister of Foreign Affairs of France, I could be working for the UN or the European Commission or any other institutions. And the internal aspects of feminist foreign policy are often overlooked, undervalued, but actually essential. So if you don't have an institutional culture where you have been putting more women at the table, promoting women at the level of management and decision making inside the ministries, inside the government, inside the different offices and so on, you never reach the point when um, a crisis hits and you have to make a decision, you know, and snap, and then you know that you're gonna have the feminist angle speaking at the table. And this is what has happened. Despite all the good work we're doing um, in all of our countries, we didn't have enough women still at the decision-making table. And when you have to make a decision in a half an hour, uh, because it's, it's a huge emergency, 
you need to have somebody who doesn't even think, well, I have to mainstream the feminist angle because it's actually integrated into their brain. And so the first revolution is to promote more women inside foreign policy circles and inside foreign policy institutions. This is why we need to have more female ambassadors, female uh, women at all decision making and management levels inside the ministry. This is why you need to convince men that it's also not against them, but they also need to be promoting feminist foreign policy um, inside the cabinet of the minister, inside the circles around the president and prime minister and so on. And this is the reality that we're still facing pretty much everywhere in the world. So I would say uh, institutional revolution. My second point, as um, you already pointed out, is that so far, so four countries have officially adopted a famous foreign policy, Sweden, Canada, France, and Mexico, and others have signaled um, their intention to do it or almost adopted it, Spain, Luxembourg, and so on. I think others will follow suit. But we do agree that there's no single conceptual framework or even a practical framework for what is a famous foreign policy. Sweden and Canada have come up with their own um, guidelines. So you have the Handbook for Swedish foreign, Feminist Foreign Policy, which is a little bit of a Bible for us all. Uh, you do have guidelines from Go Global Affairs Canada. And I have to say for France, we still do not have any document that actually explains uh, in detail what, a fe what our feminist foreign policy is. We do have, and we've had for a long time, an international strategy for gender equality, which is not exactly the same as a conceptual framework for a feminist foreign policy. So we rely a lot on conversations, dialogues, exchanges of best practices between myself and my counterparts from these countries, and also my counterparts from other countries that are not officially a feminist foreign policy country, but in many ways have adopted the gender angle. I'm thinking of Germany, I'm thinking of the UK, I'm thinking of Finland and Norway, uh, I'm thinking of Denmark, the Netherlands. They do not, they haven't adopted officially in a feminist foreign policy, but in many ways sometimes their foreign policy is more feminist than ours in France. So there is a performative um, function also to uh, the fact of adopting uh, officially a feminist uh, foreign policy. But our understanding of what it is, is definitely very different. I'm going to take one example from the report is that your recommendation, the report is that, or your position is that a feminist foreign policy is, I quote, fundamentally pacifist, that it is incompatible with arms trade. And I am assuming there was a number of debates around these recommendations. And I can tell you for clear that obviously this is not the position of the French government, which is one of the five nuclear powers. And we have had a lot of internal external debates, whether the fact that we have an important military, that we have many overseas uh, military interventions, and we're actually expanding our military budget um, in, in recent years, is it compatible with the feminist foreign policy? I would argue that it is. Uh, maybe I'm biased because I work for the government and I know there's a lot of, of, of uh, debates around that, but this is definitely um, something that isn't, you know, uh, one-sided or at least unilateral um, in the conversation. And then different countries also sort of stress different uh, focuses or for different priorities. Um, Sweden is very clear. It's the three R's, uh, rights, resources, representations. Canada is mostly focused on overseas developments, but also rights. We have different angles. We're just starting to integrate the feminist angle into what might be the climate policy, into trade policy, into security policy, but this is very much the, uh, the beginning. So we do have a lot of debates and, and, and really um, um, differences, divergences, discrepancies between ourselves as to what is a feminist foreign policy. And I think it's sometimes confusing for other member states that might be looking to adopt a feminist foreign policy because there's not just one handbook, one guideline that says what do you have to do. But fortunately, there are many think tanks that are working on that. We see the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, which I know is contributing to the report uh, with whom we're working closely in London and Berlin. 
uh, the International Center for the Research on Women in Washington, D.C. also. And we have a number of sort of unofficial circles where we exchange a lot of good practices between ourselves and we try to recruit also new, new members. And then my third point is, um, it's, it's interesting because I think a lot of the, the viewpoints on feminist foreign policy is that it has to, to break with the traditional views of what foreign policy is. This is what Jonas, you were describing, which is, or somebody else, I think, is that um, it is a traditional competition between states that is um, based on the hierarchy between international powers. Uh, basically the realist um, uh, uh, definition of what a diplomacy of foreign policy is. I would be provocative and say quite the reverse. My, my position is to say that because it is, it is true that we're in a world, you know, based on member states, uh, based on confrontation, based on hard power competition, what we need to do, what I need to do, at least as a practitioner as of today, this year, is to make sure that feminist uh, foreign policy, gender equality, women's rights, are part of the hard power competition. And they're not just considered a soft power issue. And this has slowly been the case progressively over the past five to 10 years. So historically, women's rights were considered a sub theme of, um, of human rights in general. And they were just looked at through the humanitarian angle. And what you're showing in the report is that women's rights go well beyond you, the humanitarian um, actions uh, in, in crisis and, and emergency. This has also to do with environment. This has to do uh, with the economy. This has to do with trade. This has to do with security and so on. And this has been a slow progress, a slow development. Um, and this unfortunately has been somehow somewhat imposed to us by those that are on the other side of the spectrum of what feminist foreign policy is and what I consider to be progressive values. So the rise of conservative forces, conservative governments that are orchestr orchestrating a backlash against women's rights and gender equality has forced Conserv uh, sorry, progressive governments that have adopted a feminist foreign policy to position themselves in this hard power competition and considering that women's rights are a hard power issue and not just a soft power issue. It's not just a development issue. It's not just overseas ODA. Uh, it's not just, you know, facilitating access of women to health and education or water in, in somewhere in Africa. This is actually a hard power competition. And I will finish here with this point is, among the four areas that you have outlined in your report, I would argue that the most important one is the issue of gender-based violence and sexual and reproductive health and rights. Why is that? There is no economic freedom. There is no climate freedom. There is no climate justice. There is no international security. If women are not safe and secure in their bodies and do not have a free choice, over their own bodies. This is often an argument that we use with governments such as the, the current uh, US administration that is very actually active on economic equalities, economic empowerment of women, but it is strongly uh, reverting women's uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights. So if a woman has no choice over her own body, her own reproduction, if she cannot choose whether she wants to have children, when she wants to have children, how many children she wants to have, if she has seven children that it was not a choice for her, how can she become an entrepreneur? How can she, um, you know, become a CEO? How can she just be part of the economic world in her own country? It is impossible because she didn't have a choice. So I would argue that sort of the, the central point is being free from violence in having bodily autonomy from this stems the entire spectrum of feminist foreign policy and women's rights. And then you can link it to climate justice, you can link it to security, you can link it to um, economy and so on, and all of the other aspects of feminist foreign policy. But if you cannot ensure that women are free from violence and choose 
uh, sorry, free to choose um, to make decisions for their own body, then you cannot make them peace builders or put them at the negotiating table. You cannot make them part of the economic power. Uh, you cannot make them um, uh, uh, climate negotiators and so on and so on. So this is why it's so important and this is why we are really facing a huge backlash from conservative governments all over the world. Uh, the current US administration, Brazil, Russia, China, uh, many countries in the Middle East and so on. And this is why this is pretty much the, the seed of, of everything. In, and this is why it has become a hard power issue for us because we have to battle the, these um, influences and conservative governments. So thank you again, uh, congratulations. I hope this gives a little bit perspective from a practitioner point of view uh, and congratulations to the whole team.